It's God. It's not me. Yeah. I'm telling you, I don't know how I'm here, to be honest with you. Yeah. I don't know. You still have a smile on your face, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what what, we, what else we going to do? <laughs> you know? What what else? Yeah. You, you're like, yes, it hurts, you know? And, and when we started to talk about the rest of the journey, it's been a lot of pain. But if you have the ability to get out of bed and make a decision. Welcome to Connecting the Dots. I'm your host, Jessica Carice. And this space is a place where we talk about seemingly random topics, but in all actuality, they're connected together. And today we have a very special guest. We have Malaysia Harrell, who is the founder and CEO of Blissful Life Consulting. She's also a spiritual transformation coach, an author, a speaker, and a veteran. Welcome, 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 Malaysia. I'm so happy to Thank have you, you here. Thank you so much for having me, Jessica. <laughs> I'm so excited to learn about your journey, your life, Thank everything you. that happened to you. I know you had a near-death experience and you know a very, very challenging, difficult childhood. So... Let's dive in. Let's okay. dive in. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your childhood. What was it like growing up? Where did you grow up? Um, I grew up in Springfield, Massachusetts, which is um, about, I don't know, two and a half hours from New York City. Um, so it was, you know, um, kind of a violent city um, to live in. And um yeah, I, I grew up with my mom. My mom was a single parent and she had three girls. I was the oldest of three girls. And I really um, became the mom to my sisters because my mom, she really struggled with health challenges, mm -hmm. uh, mental illness, um, alcoholism, um, and ad addiction to like pain, you know, medication and stuff like that. And um, she she did the best that she could with what she knew and the resources that she had. Mm -hmm. But our environment for me, it became very wow. violent. And so a lot of uh, mental and physical abuse. Um, mm -hmm. I also you know, experienced sexual abuse from several different people when I was a little girl. And um, so I grew up, I love my sisters and I really didn't want anything to happen to them or have to go into the system. So I was this person who learned how to wear this mask. You know, I could have just gotten beat. And when I go outside, unless there were bruises on my face, you would not have known. Like I was able mm -hmm. to get in the character when I went outside the home. And coming up in a, you know, environment where especially homes of African-American um, families, you know, it was really the motto. What goes on in the home stays stays in the home. There wasn't you know, you didn't share this information with, you know, other people. Um, but I will say that, you know, my mom given everything that she went through and hearing all the traumas that she experienced, I do understand or have more of an awareness about, you know, probably where she was coming from with her situation. Mm -hmm. And so, I'm, you know, I'm not like, oh, I'm this person just bashing, but it gives you really foresight to my life and, and where I am today. And for me, um, you know, I, I didn't feel like I got love at home. So, you know, my love or my validation came from school. It came from my teachers. It came from mentors. And what I realized now is that, you know, I had angels sprinkled throughout my life at different times. And so I remember I had one teacher, she would come and pick me up, just me and oh, wow. go roller skating. Oh, wow. And now that I think about everything and I talk with my cousin and she's like, no, I think I think our great grandmother sent her over there to come pick you up because they were in the same church. But she was a teacher at one of my schools. And so there was always, you know, or I was in the get talented and gifted programs for everything for from being a writer to science to, you know, political speaking and getting accepted to go to girl state for the state of Massachusetts. Like I was always like had all these things going on that really helped me to, you know, to get by. 
And I remember it was about right before I went into junior high school is when there was an incident where uh, my uncle came over and he didn't want, my mom didn't want to open the door. She was, you know, she kept us away from a lot of people. And um, when he finally got in, he saw the bruises that was on me because normally I would hide the bruises. And so when I went to school, you know, I worked to hide them. I might be wearing a sweater in the summertime, you know, whatever. And then just a lot thinking about that. And um, so the cops were called, my mom actually called the cops and on him and the cops came and he explained, he, he waited until the cops got there, explained, you know, what was going on and they removed me from the home. And so I actually went and lived with my grandmother, my mother's mother. And I stayed with her until I went to college. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow, wow. What about your sisters? Well, my sisters, they did stay with my mom, like kind of temporarily. And, you know, they had their own experiences and, you know, had to go live with other people and stuff as well um, after I ended up leaving. Mm. So was the dynamic that you would be, you would get the brunt of, the abuse yes. and kind of oh, protect yeah. your sisters. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I wow. thought my mom hated me. I didn't, I didn't understand. I really didn't. I just, Ooh, it was, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. You know, it's <sighs> when you describe that situation and the outside help, there were so many people fighting to help you and, and you were trying to hide it. You know, yeah. like, yeah, I, I, I worked so hard to hide it because I, I, I was thinking about the impact on my sisters. Right. And not wanting to leave them. And I didn't want anything to happen to my mother either, obviously. And um, I remember in not junior high school's middle school, there was a social worker um, I'll never forget her. I think her name was Mrs. Knowles and she came to the school and I don't know how this ended up happening, but they ended up taking us girls and, you know, bringing us in this back room and talking to us. And I don't know if this was all ordained or, you know, they kind of got me in there and the situation happened. But I remember it was a small group. And so she started talking about, you know, just, you know, basically leading into abuse and, you know, what it was to be mistreated and, I started crying. I, I couldn't even control it. I was crying so bad. And when I met with her, I said, don't tell. You cannot tell. You cannot tell. And then I was afraid I was going to get beat really bad if, you know, if they found out too. And so at that point, she did know and I confided in her. And, um, you know, she told, I think, I believe she told the principal and I remember, I remember the principal calling my mom one time and I don't remember exactly what it was for, but I think it was something that they were concerned about, about me. And I think they had seen bruises one day. I'm not exactly sure, but again, they were very protective, you know, and did not call child welfare at that time. And so, yeah, you know, but I was very, I met with my social worker you know, pretty often. So she really checked in with me and everything. Wow. Yeah. So how did your uncle get involved to basically come rescue you? Um, well, I think he had come over and I'm not sure exactly why he came over, but he knew we were home and he kept knocking on the door and um, she finally let him in and they had an argument. And so you know, I don't, I don't know. I just think everything is God. I feel like I had, like I was saying, protectors and angels yeah. um, with me throughout my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Wow. Oh my goodness. You know, it, there, there are times in my life where I, there was um, um, substance abuse that was in the household, you know, for a little bit. It wasn't my whole my whole childhood was just for a moment. So like whenever I hear stories where that's your whole entire childhood, 
and you actually had physical abuse and everything like you know my my heart goes out to you because Thank i you. you know I, prior to starting this podcast i thought that segment in my life was like oh my gosh you know like the worst thing ever but then it's like you know i didn't get any physical abuse or anything like that. I didn't have to hide bruises or anything. And when I hear your story and then hearing how all the teachers and stuff, I think they knew, you know, they, there's always so too. I I think they knew and, you know, I'm just hiding and nobody, you know, I think in the world doesn't know, I think people know. And, you know, and also I want to acknowledge you because, you know, being a psychotherapist and treating, you know, people all these years, it's not necessarily about, you know, your story was not as significant because, and I will tell you, I believe that the mental abuse was almost more damaging than the physical. Mm -hmm. I still have marks from the extension cords and all the things I was beat with, but I will tell you the mental piece of it, it it impacts you in such a significant way that it affects your relationships. It affects so many things throughout your entire life. So you might be this older adult and you don't really understand or realize certain things that you do, or, you know, I was someone who really protected myself. So, you know, I had long-term relationships, but I, I would, I would, I could, I could wave my finger, snap it and you poof, be gone type thing. Like that's, I mean, to the point where I never even thought about you, you know, of course you still had your pain and your, your grief, but after a while, what's your name again? Yeah. Who are yeah. you? Yeah. I had those <laughs> tendencies. I had those tendencies to cut someone quick. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Really interesting. <laughs> like, I remember growing up, you know, like when you when you when you're in college or something, and girls are like, "How do you just move on?" I'm like, "Girls, easy," you know, but not yeah. knowing it's like a response, like a survival response. Like it is, you know, too emotional. And there's hurt. always somebody waiting around the corner too. <laughs> <laughs> That is true. Like, oh, oh, you know, oh, he gone. Okay, let me knock on the door. You know what I mean? Like, so. <laughs> oh my God, yo! Like, I make jokes with my husband. I'm like, babe, you gotta make sure you stay on your best behavior because every once in a while, <laughs> someone from the past slides in my DM. Like, so married? I'm like, yes, happily. Like, <laughs> that's so fun. No, no, he's he's great. No, but but I'm just saying that that makes it a little different too when there's always somebody waiting around and hiding in the bushes. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness! Wow. <laughs> so 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 when you when you were I guess you know. So you were, you still had your good grades, you had school. So you basically, so you were able to have dreams and aspirations and basically oh, yeah. plot your exit strategy, right? What was that oh, like? Yeah. yeah, I, um, so I was really good. I was good at so many things, but, you know, intellectually leadership, you know, I was in, um, junior ROTC mm-hmm. in high school and junior high school, I was in the band And Mm -hmm. um, but before that, I wanted to model. And I remember I got accepted for John Casablanca's modeling school and it was downtown in Springfield. And I used to. So that was still when I was with my mom, actually. I don't know. I think we went to a mall or some sort of event and someone saw me. And um, my mom, I got a scholarship, so I didn't have we didn't have to we didn't have the money for that. And so I got to go to modeling school for a short period of time. But let me just tell you, Jessica, when you move in with grandparents and her great and my grandmother's mother, my great grandmother, they were really influential in my life. We're not even talking about modeling like it was okay to do the hair shows, you know, for Mm -hmm. um, I used to do the hair shows and different events in my hometown. And um, but no beauty. No, no, no. You you going to school, you're going to be, you know, and so I wasn't I didn't really have the chance to model after that. Mm -hmm. When I was in college, there was I remember the student who needed 
a subject, a model for his photos for school. Mm -hmm. And so I remember doing a model and shoot when I was, I still got some of them pictures. I was real, I I was real cute. Like, (laughs) and so, um, yeah, I thought I had those aspirations. And then, you know, again, getting into band and getting into junior ROTC and being, you know, in student government, I knew that there was just so much more. And with junior ROTC in high school, um, I remember Chief Master Sergeant Palmer um, his daughter was an aha uh-huh girl for um, Ray Charles. And you remember the Pepsi aha uh-huh girl videos? Mm-hmm. I might be dating myself, <laughs> <laughs> but um, he he just saw the world in me and he wanted mm-hmm. me to go to the Air Force Academy. And, you know, at that time, I, number one, I was afraid. I had never been out of, lived out of Springfield, Massachusetts at the time in high school. And I was just really afraid and I didn't want to go to the academy. And then I saw this video and he had someone from the school who was, you know, um, an African-American male. He was an office. He was a recruiter and they were looking for people of color. And I just decided I was like, Jessica, ROTC had took up my all my childhood years. There were events that I couldn't go to with my class. And I was just like, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. So I did. Ended up doing one year of ROTC in college for the Army Mm -hmm. and one year for the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And then I just it didn't end up um, going. But I always remembered that when every year I was on the drill team with rifles and one year, every year we used to come to the White House. We would go Mm -hmm. to um, first we would stop in New York. Um, We would go to Fort Dix. We would stay at Fort Dix in Jersey, and then we would always go to the Twin Towers, okay, Mm -hmm. in New York every single year, and we would go to the Capitol, and we would go to the White House. So at that time, I always thought about what it would be like to be a congresswoman or a senator Mm -hmm. or someone who is making influence, you know, influence on our community, knowing what I went through as a child. And all the things, all the things. And um, so I always wanted, I knew I wanted to make a difference. I didn't know. Um, One of our mayor, um, he's a senator now, Senator Richard Neal. I used to work on his campaigns as a child. Oh, wow. So there was always these sprinkles that would occur in different parts of my life that just in it, it encouraged me in such a significant way to know that you can make a difference in your community. You can make a difference for humanity. And I just always wanted to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, it's like, as you're painting the, the picture of your early years, it's like, you know, you have this traumatic, you know, physical abuse section, but then you have all these areas of just opportunities of, you know, making yourself great. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think about that now, would you say that had those things, I mean, I had so much happen to me. You would need 10 shows, a series for us to go through all of them. And that's not really the goal, but the goal is to say that no matter what you go through, there's always going to be light in that dark situation. Always. There was always these little things. I was always getting honored scholarships, scholarships from senators, so many things and blessings that I had, you know, but as I started writing my story and my memoirs, I just, when I looked at how much I had been through, you know, and I look at, you talked about the greats and things that they went through and It's like those things had to happen to you in order for you to even think the way you think, in order for you to have the impact on the lives that you have. If you didn't go, and not to say that you can't be great and not go through these things, but I'm just saying you have a different mindset. And when you face different types of challenges in life, you already been built. You already been to war at a young age, Mm -hmm. you know, negotiating my salary at McDonald's as a teenager. Who's doing that? 
no negotiating one. my salary. No one. Everyone's like, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I'll take whatever I you give me. I will never. So I, my first job was at nine years old. I had a paper route. Now, again, I told you, and we had talked before, and I told you about the financial things that we went through to the point mm-hmm. going to churches to get free food and going to, in the, you know, in the welfare line, that, that cheese was off the chain though, for making them grilled cheeses. <laughs> um, it was very good, but you know, to the point where I was telling you, like there was this ministry, I grew up seven day Adventist with my mom and there was this ministry and, you know, they used to collect with the cans being at the front door, collecting money. And I remember my mom, we would have a can and we, we would act like we were with the church and we would be getting money for ourselves, like mm-hmm. literally like a homeless person standing out there for money. But we had this front as we're, we're representing our church. Wow. And so for me, nine years old, I had a paper route. Uh, my mom used to take all the money. So they stopped giving me papers because she she never paid the money. So they after a while, it would she needed the money for food. Right. She needed the money. And I understood that. And so they didn't let me do the paper route anymore. So I remember when I was in, I think it was right before junior high, they had this program, you know, for underserved children, you know, to go and they would put you in a job for the summer. And so I worked at the girls and boys club and Mm. I worked the front desk and I had all my little suits. And again, I was with my grandmother. So I was a B, you know, when it came to money, when it came to leadership, when it came to getting things done, like it was not even an issue. She was so proud of me. And she was like my biggest cheerleader. And she Mm. always made sure, you know, that I, I stayed on the right path. That's what I will say. Mm -hmm. And um, so I did that that summer. And I think so. Right. So that was about 12 years old. And then I was 14 and a half when I got my first job at McDonald's. You couldn't tell me nothing. (laughs) Um, You know, I didn't have work papers yet. I wasn't 16. Got a hookup from a family, you know, and I got and I worked that job. And at the time it was a corporate McDonald's. And again, like I didn't even know about this stuff till I started working there about franchises and corporate corporations. And so I remember the summer after I think it was the summer I turned when I was 15, I decided to leave McDonald's and go on a hiatus so I could make more money. I went to the tobacco field. I worked for Cobra Tobacco in Connecticut. They would pick us up in a school bus, Jessica, a school bus, and we would be transported out. And I was thinking, I was just talking with a friend about that. And I was like, I was making like $300 a week. I was rich. Yeah, I was rich. I never seen people make that kind like I was rich. So I left to get my money for the summer and I actually lasted the whole summer. I think out of a whole several busloads of students, I think only like maybe less than 10 of us lasted the whole summer. But of course, you know, the guys who were coming over for the summer for Jamaica, they did a lot of the work. I still worked hard, (laughs) but they would be doing the work for me and sewing up the tobacco (laughs) and But I know I was about that money. So it was like I needed to do what I needed to do to make that money. And then I ended up coming back to McDonald's after the summer Mm -hmm. and it was purchased. And a gentleman named Richard Bertram, he purchased the McDonald's. So it was a franchise. And when I tell you, he mentored me to talk about what it was to be a Democrat, what it was to be a Republican, teaching Hmm. me about leadership, teaching me about management. He really took me under his wing. He was like, I heard about you before you even came back. I did all the birthday parties. I learned how to cook behind the, the, um, you know, and so by the time I was 16, I knew how to run the entire store. I knew how to open a store. I knew how to close the store. So here's what the issue came up for negotiating my salary and my worth. So minimum wage was like maybe four something at the time. I say 425 and it went up to maybe 430 or 450. And so the people who were working at fries who only knew how to do fries were making like 10 cents less than me. I'm trying to calculate and add it up. I can do the whole store and you can only do fries and you making a couple cents less than me. 
Oh, no. Mm -hmm. So I talked to my grandmother. I came home and I was like, Nana, I was like minimum wage went up and people who only know how to fr do fries. They make an almost the same amount as me. And so she was like, OK, go ask for a meeting with Rick and, and talk to him. And I did. So I was like, you know, can I schedule a meeting with, you know, and I, again, I'm like 16, just turning 16, whatever. Okay. You. So I told him, I said, listen, I said, you know, I really love working here. And he knew, like I knew the customers, I knew their orders before they even, all the older people that came in, I could get their order right when they walk in the store. Like, I just loved it. It was my life and it was something new, you know, and mm -hmm. making money and having responsibility and again, doing well at work. I was always, you know, honor for that. And so I was like, so, you know, I, I want to request a raise. I said, these people are making this much and I'm making this much, but I, I'm more, basically I'm more valuable to the company, to your franchise. And so he was like, well, you know, in order, and he was saying he loved what I do and my work ethic and all of that. He said, um, but in order for me to give you a raise, you have to become a manager. So I just, I, I sat back like, okay. But you're doing all the manager stuff. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, waiting for something to come out of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let's, okay. What do we got to do? Yeah. Yeah. So he didn't offer me a management position. And so I said, well, you know, I'm giving you my two weeks notice. I already had another job lined up. Oh, Again, knowing your work, don't don't come to the table to the to the to the to the line. Put your face on that line and not be ready to do what you say you're gonna do, and and really know what your worth is. And so um, I went to work at Kmart and retail. I hated it. I don't know why. I did not. It wasn't me. It wasn't. You know, I like the interaction with people and, you know, and I wasn't on the, you know, on a cash register. I was on, yeah. you know, doing clothes and folding yeah, them and, and straightening out the rent. No, you know, and the people there weren't motivated either. I always mm. wanted to be environments where I could learn. So I'm always the young person at a job and learning mm. what you do. I even worked at Mass Mutual Life Insurance Company when I was, you know, when I got a little older. Mm -hmm. So. You know, and I, so I was in high school essentially with two jobs, McDonald's and wow. Mass Mutual Life Insurance. So when he didn't offer me, you know, I went to McDonald's, I mean, to um, Kmart, and he called me back within like a month to, as to be a manager at 16. Oh. <laughs> so wow. remember that commercial with Calvin and he was 16 and he was a manager, I think at Burger King or McDonald's. I don't remember, but it was Calvin. I was before I was a manager before Calvin came out. Wow. Yeah. Wow. A young manager. Yeah. So you, so you quit the Kmart and went back to the manager at McDonald's. Oh yeah. yeah. When he called me, okay. When you, I was waiting to get out of there. <laughs> like, yeah. I didn't want to be there. Yeah. You know, yeah. it didn't matter if it was more money. If, if it, you know, if it doesn't allow you to be in a space of peace. Yes. It's not money. It's not all about money all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you need <laughs> to learn a lesson about, you know, making sure you take care of the employees that bring you value. Like <laughs> that part. That's what it really is. And and employees, uh, partners, peers, mm -hmm. you know, you think, oh, this person is nothing, you know. And then, you know, of course, I'm ultimately going in the military. You think, oh, they, you know, they do the trash or whatever, but they're married to the chief master sergeant of the base, of the command chief. You know what I mean? Like you think and again, you should treat everybody because I've seen it where somebody make a phone call and you your your interview starts the minute you contact them from your email from your phone contact so if you treat someone as if they are beneath you mm -hmm. they're going to tell the person who's interviewing you that person has a say mm -hmm. you know they don't people don't understand that <laughs> yeah yeah value your people and value everyone that you every life every human Every being that you come in contact with, you value them. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, I believe that through and through, like 100 percent treating everybody yeah. with respect. It doesn't matter what you do. No. Yeah. 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 Wow. So it's your life is so full. 
<laughs> very grateful. Like very That's very a good grateful. word. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, even from a young age, and you know, and, and you know, we were chatting a couple times, up, you know, off the podcast, and like everything you say you want to do, I know you're gonna do it. Like yeah. you have that foundational building block, yeah, like already instilled in you, yeah, you know. So yeah, now, now I have mm -hmm. new angels. You know, my dad, me and him became close when I was in junior high school. So, you know, then my grandmother, then I had my dad and I still have my dad now. So it's like just leaning on your the people who truly love you, not the people who want to know you because of something that you can offer them. And then the next moment, I mean, in business thing, you know, there's business relationships, but what I'm saying is don't just use people. And then when they're down and out, and they've mentored you, they've been there for you, and then you just fall off the face of the earth, and then they want to mm -hmm. circle back. <laughs> you know? Get good again. It's, those opportunities may not be there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That's true. So, I guess walk me through that process how your dad got introduced into your life. Because, so it was just you and yeah. your mom. Was so, my. Mm -hmm. What were you going to say? No, I was just recapping. It was you and your mom, and your sisters. Yeah. And then how did that happen when he got introduced, re reintroduced into it? So my dad and my mom were never married mm -hmm. and they had two children together. So my baby sister has a different dad. And um, so I think when their relationship broke off, because I think when they had my, when they had my sister, he they still weren't together, mm -hmm. like living together at that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. But um, so there were a lot of times when I wasn't able to see my dad when I was little, you know, because of that relationship. Okay. And um, how we really became close is I'll never forget this day. But I got a call at McDonald's and. My uncle had called McDonald's and my supervisor that I told you about that. He called me by my my dad's last name. And so they were like, he, they're asking for, you know, a Malaysia Wiggins. And and I'm like, oh, that's my dad's last name. So I get on the phone. And it's my uncle. And he's telling me my dad was in a bad car accident. Oh, wow. They had to get the jaws of life to get him out. And I I was going to lose it. Like, oh, I got to go. I dropped everything. And I went to the hospital. Um, he was in ICU, I oh, believe, wow. um, at that time. And then, you know, he ultimately got out of ICU. And we just really became close. Now, he had had a conversation with me right when I graduated to kind of tell me what was going on. And we had a heart to heart. Mm -hmm. And I was just so blessed to have my dad and have that relationship with him. Yeah. And when that happened, you know, I just... You know, I, I I left. I went to the store. I mean, went to the hospital. Um, I used to go there every single day after work. I would sneak him McDonald's. <laughs> he always wanted a strawberry milkshake. Yeah. So I was sneaking him, you know, because you get in the hospital and your weight's going down. So I was sneaking him food. Yeah. But I think that really brought us together because you realize how, how fragile life was, you know, mm -hmm. at that time. And so, you know, I, just, I love my dad. <laughs> You know, is this the same uncle that came to your mom's house that called no. you? Oh, so you have two no. different uncles. That's a different. So that uncle was my dad's brother. Ah, yeah. Okay. Who called? Oh yeah. wow. Huh. Okay. So, so he knew. How did he find you? Because this was before. They knew, everybody knew I worked at McDonald's. Well, everybody, so everybody just knew. It's a small city. I oh, mean, everybody know I work at McDonald's oh, now. You okay, know, okay. everybody would come in there and be like, Malaysia told me to come and apply for a job. And then he'd come to, Richard would come to me and be like, you know them. And I I think it was literally one person that I recommended out of all. The, just because I know you don't mean I recommend you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. how small was the town? Because, like, I'm thinking Springfield is like I I get I get like a pre-existing like size of it because I think the Simpsons are like in Springs. Of well, and you never I I don't think I ever knew which Springfield the Simpsons yeah, was because right? there's so many Springfield Springfield Missouri Springfield Virginia. There's so and so I for um, I can't even think of how many. It, it's like I mean uh, definitely. Smaller than New York, 
um, well, not the whole, but it, it's, it was a very small town, mm. you know? I mean, it's big enough that you don't know every single person in the town, mm -hmm. but it was small enough that if you lived in certain communities, you pretty much knew, or your grandparents, mm. because the city was so small, like if I brought someone home, they'd be like, who are your grandparents? Who are your parents? They would know oh. somebody in your family, especially if they were someone of color, they would know. Oh Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Okay. They'd be like, oh, <laughs> like, yeah. I think they judge you based on who your family was. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. That makes sense. Wow. Okay. It's like, that's so, that's so different than how I grew up. Cause like, like my, my parents, they immigrated from Jamaica and then we were mm -hmm. living in New York for a little bit when I was born. And, we, you know, so we hopped around a bit. So it's like, yeah. yeah. So that concept is always so fascinating to me where like people in the town know you, the grandparents know the family and then, you know, like a whole lineage reputation thing. So that's always so yeah. fascinating to me. Yeah. 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 I grew up where you know, the neighbor would be like, I'm gonna call your mom. You know what I mean? Like the name, not every single neighbor, but a yeah. lot of the neighbors knew each other. Yeah. And yeah, so it was, it was a little dangerous, but you know, where I grew up also, especially being in the church, the different churches, mm -hmm. you know, being seven day Adventist, and then, you know, going to the Baptist church when I moved with my grandmother, so, you know, I was exposed to so many things, so many people, school systems, pro leadership programs, stuff like that. So, yeah, that was that was good, though. That was good. Yeah. Yeah. And you have your uncles looking out for you, both of them <laughs> life changing, you know, interventions. Yeah. You know? So yeah. How I don't think it I don't think it. I don't I know now. OK, it was supposed to go, to, but I didn't think of it like that, someone coming to save me, you know, I just, at the time, I didn't think of it like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah but it's like, it's, it's like when you tell your story to, especially, you know, I knew nothing really about much about how you grew up or anything about your background in, in that type of way. So yeah. when you're, you're telling me your story, it's just, I just see like these little, like, uh, linkages, right? Tiny you know? miracles. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Which you have on Instagram live every Thursday yeah. at 7 p.m., right? Every, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're going to be on the show. They're going to see you on Tiny Miracles. <laughs> but that's that's really what it's about. That same thing that you said, no matter what you've gone through or what you're going through, you know, there's always going to be some sort of tiny miracle that's going to happen as you're going through that. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, you know, it'll feel challenging and painful at that time, but sometimes it catapults you into a life that you never even imagined yeah. how it could go. Yeah. And so that that's what I feel like has really, you know, happened to me over my lifespan. Yeah. But yeah, I was telling my sister or I was telling one of my friends the other day, I was like, I remember I was robbed. I was robbed and I was only like maybe not eight or nine years what? old. And my mom used to, you know, she used to, if you would go, you could buy your mom, your parents and whoever grown up cigarettes as a little kid, right? Hmm. They didn't have, you know, the Surgeon Generals where, mm -hmm. or the, the rule that, or the law that you had to be 18. So mm -hmm. we were able to go and I would always go to the store. And at that time where I lived, they didn't have houses in a certain area. So you can cut through a couple of streets right. to get to the store. Yeah. Now they have houses there, so you can't cut through. And um, it was about five or six guys, and they were older guys. They were like older teenagers, uh, maybe even young adult, like 18, 19. And they came up to me, and they used to put the money back in. My mom would put it in an envelope and tie it in my coat. Mm. And I remember that day I was kind of like, oh, I'm older now. You know, I don't need that. That's for the kids, mm. you know, hiding my money. And um, I had it in my hand um. and I remember them coming up to me. And again, the way I was where I live, you had to be strong, you know, and um, you just, I mean, you had to be really tough. And I remember I looked at them like, you know, what I mean, like, yeah. I mean, I was probably I was scared, but I didn't back down. I didn't run. I knew they was going to catch me. Yeah. You know, and he was like, what's in your hand? And I was like, nothing. And he took my hand and he bit my hand. One of the guys bit my hand 
and he took the money. And I do you know, Jessica, I waited till I got home to cry. I refused to cry in public. I refused yeah. to let them know that anything was wrong. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like you were used to, well, you were kind of used to wearing the, the mask at that, at that point too, oh, right? Yeah. You weren't letting oh, yeah. anyone see you vulnerable. So it makes sense no. to let them see you cry. Not at that time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Jeez. That's so crazy. Did they eventually get caught or... That was no, that. I, I I said I didn't know who it was, but I know exactly who it was and who it is and the group of guys. But they knew I knew they knew who my uncle was. And I think they might have gone to school with him. And I was afraid that someone would go to jail hmm. or be harmed in a very harmful way. Hmm. So mm -hmm. I didn't want to be the catalyst for someone getting hurt or losing their life. Yeah. Was was there like gang violence where you were? Oh living? yeah, oh yeah, mm -hmm. oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I went to funerals at such young ages. Um, my first funeral, it wasn't due to gun violence. Um, one funeral I went to in first grade. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the students, she died in a fire uh, with her sister and the ba and their baby. What? brother i think i think it was a baby brother wow. so three of them died i went to that was my first funeral and um you know i had some i, I had people die in high school um so yeah it was you know and, and then people in the community that you knew there were always you know someone getting injured or or mm -hmm. hurt mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wow jeez that's yeah that's I'm blessed. a lot i'm blessed i'm yeah. super blessed that's a lot. You went through yeah. a lot. I think my yeah. first funeral was probably when my grand my grandfather died. That was my first funeral, and I was like ten or so, like ten or eleven. Yeah, you you you've seen so much. I did. You know what? I went to one before that. What? But I was talking about people that like my friends. Yeah. So one, it was my cousin's father, and he was a military hero. And um, I remember my mom didn't want to go in and she dropped me off to run in and see the body and run out. So that was my first. It was so traumatic that I mean, I had nightmares. But yeah, that being instead of bringing your child in and explaining to them. And um, yeah, Jeez. I ran out of there screaming, crying. That was my first experience. Oh my but, God. but I was saying. You know, as far as friendships or people yeah. that I knew there were, you know, throughout my childhood. Wow. So all these years, like you're going through traumatic experience after traumatic experience and traumatic experience. Yeah. Then it's blessing, 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 blessing. Yeah. All happening at the same time. At so, the same time. I mean, you don't see it at that time. Yeah. You don't you don't acknowledge it. You don't realize it's not till years later you're like. How, what is different about me? How did I not end up like some other people have ended up, yeah. you know, who've had other things, but I feel like, you know, everybody, people get addicted to things yeah. and, but I was addicted to success. I was addicted to being seen as, you know, someone who needed validation, you know, through getting recognition and getting all these things as opposed to, I mean, I love to serve though. Like service was something that even from a young age, we used to have, you know, where we would feed people for um, Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. It was a whole city. They would have this big thing. The news station would come and we would always serve food before I got that. I, I love that. Like I, I felt like there was a level of healing or energy that mm -hmm. came to you when you help to serve other people. Yeah. But at the same time, I needed someone to tell me that I was good or or worthy of life because I felt like, you know, the things that were told to me. And again, there were so many, many other traumas that I taught that I didn't really get in deep into, mm -hmm. but I needed that validation to say that was love, but it wasn't, it's not love. At the end of the day, you can get an Emmy, you could get a trophy and go home and be that same hurt lonely, scared little girl mm -hmm. that you were before. It'll give you very temporary gratification. Yeah. So. 
Yeah. You know, something that temporary gratification, I, I get it because then you, you just move on to the next thing, into the next thing, into the next thing, into the next thing. And well, already, work already. What's next? Yeah. We still talking about this? <laughs> yeah. Like what's next? What's next? And you know, then you, you don't really take the time to acknowledge yourself and be like, you did a good job. That self yes, validation, the self love. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. But at the same time, it was necessary for you so that you didn't end up in the streets. You know, you didn't end up because you had all of that. You could have easily ended up in the streets. Easily. Easily. Easy. I don't think my I think my grandparents would have been proud of a little hard on me, you know, and they were people that would have they had great discernment. So if I was dating someone or someone came over the house, even a, a girlfriend, and they'd be like, No, nah, mm -mm, that's a fast girl. I don't like that girl. Mm -mm. You know, they were very vocal about mm -hmm. who I hung around. Because they saw they saw they saw there was something different about you. Mm -hmm. They saw there was something they different. did. They did. And they wanted to protect that. They did. So when yeah. you went to college, uh, I guess, t walk me through that transition because you're also a veteran and you spoke about yes. how you turned down, you know, the, the, um, Na the Air Force Academy and you, yeah. you, you only did a year. We, I didn't even apply, but yeah, uh -huh. I, pr I probably would have got, I think I would have got, I would have gotten the endorsement um, from the congressman at, you know, he was, he's a Senator. Well, yeah, no, I needed a congressional. So he would have given me my congressional endorsement. I, I would have had that. Yeah. And yeah. So, well, I, I went to college, I had applied for several schools, but of course the selection had to be economically feasible for mm -hmm. me. So I got a scholarship to go to the university of Massachusetts, um, but it was a partial scholarship. You know, I think it paid for tuition. And then I got all these other scholarships from. So I, I went to the Urban League at the time. We didn't have the Internet to go on and search for scholarships. Hmm. And I remember I went to the Urban League and they had this big book like this big. And I literally photocopied every single one that applied to me. I applied for pageants. I was in a pageant. I did every kind of I had to do um, letters. I had to do essays. And I did so many of them and I ended up getting a lot of money wow. to go to school. Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. You're so admirable. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> your grit and tenacity and you had it from a young age. Like you, yeah. you have these skills where people, you know, are, don't even know how to begin to get. Yeah. You know, yeah, I had a counselor who was, I was his star. I was, you know, like a star basketball player. I was his star as far as in academics. And I remember him and another counselor, like, you know, like fighting against each other about who, what student was better, their student. And so I went to girl state, you know, like I got selected and it's where, you know, a certain percentage of girls in each uh, county get selected to go and represent the county. And it was like a mini version of running for Congress or running. Well, the ultimate position, it was state on the state level. So you could run for governor. Mm -hmm. And I won for secretary of state and I won. And I was one wow. of three girls who were who were African-American. There were no people of color because it was all girls. I think they have a equivalent boy state. And um, mm -hmm. there was only three African American girls, and I w I was the winner. I won the Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. So wow, yeah. So you talked about college. So I went to the University of Massachusetts. You know, and again, I didn't really know my worth. So I was with you know, I was in this relationship with this guy. Mm -hmm. He was super emotionally abusive as well. And again, I didn't really know it at that time because I had grew up with so much violence. My mom had experienced so much domestic violence too. Like I, I was in situations where we could have lost our lives, you mm -hmm. know, when I was a little girl with her. So I had saw so much violence. And um, so if it's like, oh, someone just saying certain things, like you don't think about it because yeah. you're like, well, this isn't as bad as, you know, what yeah. I went through with, you know. And so again, there's 
people who prey on people who are, who are in those situations because they mm-hmm. know they can manipulate you in many different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, I did um, one year of our, you know, ROTC Air Force, one, one year Army, ended up graduating. And um, I didn't know, you know, I did a couple of other jobs. I think I went and became, uh, I, w- I worked at a bank for a while. Um, but again, it wasn't enough money. It's like, I can't get my own apartment with this. I was still mm-hmm. living with my, I came back home and I was living with my great grandmother for a while. And I lived with my cousin for a while mm-hmm. until I had the money. And I remember um, when I got my first apartment and I think it was like, 553 for rent, $553. And it was so much money for me at the time, yeah. you know? Yeah. And um, yeah. So um, then I had to, you know, just figure out what I was going to do with my life. And I started, so working in a prison system or law enforcement was something that was lucrative or a lot more money at the time. And so, you know, I knew that, um, you know, I wanted to be something bigger than mm-hmm. what I saw in front of me. And so um, I took the exam to be a correctional officer because ultimately I wanted to be a counselor. I knew I wanted to do Mm. something in mental health. I wanted to understand what mental illness was because I had experienced it Mm. with my mom and coming up and all the things. And so I knew I wanted to, but I thought, okay, well, let me be a correctional officer because I didn't know how to be a counselor Mm. at the time. And so while I I got accepted, I was a correctional um, officer. And that was crazy. Crazy. <laughs> and then um, I started going to school and I was working two jobs. Again, I always had two or three jobs. I was making money. That was a big thing. I did not want to be poor. Yeah. And so I um, ended up doing working for the prison and also being a substitute teacher because you could call, you know, the night before and set sign up to be get more money. And so I remember one time when I was a substitute teacher, the principal of the school um, was my social worker. Stop. Was my so- and I got wow. to see her and I was like about to ball. Oh and I got to meet God. with her and I got to tell her what she meant in my life and what she did for me. Wow. And yeah, wow. she was so happy wow. to see that I turned out you know, to not be a statistic, you know, um, in a negative way. And so um, it was just, that was refreshing getting to see her. Um, And so, you know, I worked in the prison system and I started at the University of Connecticut, um, Hartford, Connecticut for the School of Social Work. And I ended up meeting this guy. I got engaged um, and he had gotten a job in Maryland And so I ended up moving here with him. I didn't want to leave my job. And my great grandmother, you know, it was like in her last years and she did not, she could not understand why I was moving with a man that I was not married to. Like that was out of the question. And I'm like, you know, grandma is going to be okay. And this and that. And um, she said to me before she passed, she's like, just don't keep, she was like, you could get as many degrees as you want, but just don't find a job where you don't keep moving jobs. Cause at that time, someone would work on a job 20, 30 year, 40 years. That's true. You know, they stayed Mm -hmm. at that one place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when I thought about it and I moved, when I was, it was time to graduate by this time, me and the gentleman, you know, we had broken up and everything that was traumatic. And so then he, I ended up, um, I was, I was either going to go, I was thinking about going into the military or going into, um, the, the FBI. I wanted to do like, uh, criminal profiling, you know, to understand why people committed crimes, why people abuse people. I wanted to understand the human mind and how, you know, what makes us do what we do or become who we become. Yeah. And I had, I remember reading the books, this, there was this one book by this female FBI agent, you know, and I read her book. I, again, I was a researcher. I wanted to know what I was getting into. And so when I interviewed or when I went to them before I took the test, I think I did take the test, mm-hmm. but I, um, they told me in order to do that, you had to have a PhD and you would have to start off like doing, you know, like street work, 
be, you know, on the beat. And I'm like, not me. Like, I'm not like where I'm from. I ain't going out there where, you know, and I had already worked in law enforcement. And so um, what what happened was 9-11 happened. That's what that's what made the decision for me. So I, I transferred to the University of Maryland. I finished school up here and I was at the Baltimore Public Defender's Office because I wanted to do. So I was becoming a social worker again. I had a social worker and I was going to be a psychiatrist. But becoming a social worker was, you know, you could do the therapy, you could do advocacy, all those things that I wanted to do. And so that's what happened. 9-11 happened. I'll never forget that day. We were watching TV. So we saw it and then saw, you know, that second plane hit the, the other twin tower. And remember that that was part of my childhood. Yeah. I went there every year. Every year. It was. Wow. So a part of my childhood was taken, I felt like was almost taken away from me with that tragedy. That day, I, I was not graduated from school yet. I said, I'm going in the military. I already knew that was the decision. Mm -hmm. I needed to serve my country. Mm -hmm. I needed to provide mental health services to you oh know our God. active duty members to keep them well. And so that's exactly what I did. I ended up um, applying in the first year I didn't get in. So this is for all the young girls out there to, who, who want something and, you know, and it's in alignment with God's purpose for you. But I ended up befriending the current year's residents because at that time you had to have a independent license in order to come into service if you came in as a regular social worker. So mm -hmm. for me, I had to go through a residency program. And at that time, they only picked out you know, four or nine people per year at the time when I went. So it's highly competitive. And so the second year I got in. So until I got in, I ended up working for um, child welfare, Montgomery County in Maryland. And at that time, so it was the intensive unit. So we actually worked in a separate area, a separate building with the family police. And so that was child fatalities and serious injuries. I don't know how I kept wanting this forensic path, but you know, forensics for for my for my master's internship, the Baltimore Public Defender, it was something about it. I don't I guess because I had seen so much darkness and was yeah. trying to figure out what's going on with the world. And so um I finished that job. That was a job I will say, especially for clinicians, people who or provide a service, you know, where you have to exchange energy with people um, in some sort of a way. That was the most challenging. So I had worked on death row when I became a counselor, you know, in the prison system. I got promoted as soon as my nine month probation was up. I got promoted to the counselor. So I had worked on death row. And so I could I could deal with adults. But when it comes to children and harm. Um, it did set me up for my career, though, but at that time doing serious injuries and fatalities. And I remember I saw this young teenage girl that came in one time and her grandmother, she had lived with her grandmother and her grandmother was abusive. Now, her grandmother had abused her mom, so I don't know how she actually got in with her. But I remember we asked to see her, you know, of course, with the medical provider, we asked to see her um, injuries, you know. And because um, they got a document and all that. When I tell you we took that little girl's clothes or she was like a teenager, she was bruised like from her whole body had bruises at all different phases. And so that was triggering for me, you know, um, seeing that. And yeah. And she was I saw me and her. Yeah. I saw me inside of her, you know, that little Malaysia who had to hide because with her clothes on, you didn't know mm -hmm. she was just like me that she had that personality. You could tell, you know, she was going places, but when you took those clothes off and you saw all the bruises. Wow. Yeah. That was going to be my next question. Like how did you deal with seeing yeah. all of this trauma? What was the question? How did you deal with seeing all this trauma? Like, again, I felt like me helping other people through these situations was going to heal me. Hmm. 
So I was sad. It was triggering, but I had a, I had a mission. I had a purpose. So I didn't let that get to me. You know, I had the nightmares. Mm -hmm. I just did what I had to do, but I knew that it was more to light. It wasn't about me at that point. Mm -hmm. So, but I didn't, again, I didn't realize how it affected me because I'm perfect, right? I got through this. I'm good. I'm good. I'm going to get through this. I've been through so much already. What? You don't realize until years later when something comes up and the whole thing come toppling down, the mountain of traumas, the door opens, the closet. So I, so I, so after that year, I got accepted into the Air Force, United States Air Force, Air Power. I still love the Air Force. And um, so, you know, I went to the residency program at Andrews Air Force Base. And then I, um, my first duty station outside of that, I went to Grand Force, North Dakota. So that was really exciting. And then from there, I went to Korea and then Hawaii. Hmm. And then at that time, the war on Afghanistan was was big. Hmm. And what happened was my brother, I had a, a half brother who actually grew up next door to me from my grandmother's house. Mm-hmm. And um, he was murdered in 2008. Oh, my God. Now, the crazy thing about this, Jessica, is that I was working in family advocacy. I was the family advocacy chief, which works with the domestic violence. So this was domestic violence month. And I was at a conference at the time when I got the call from my dad, watching all these people tell their stories of almost, you know, being murdered. And he was murdered in a domestic violence situation. And so it's like, I don't know if like my life, was foreshadowed to help me prepare me for what was to come. But it felt like now looking back, it felt like everything. And so after that happened, I knew I was going to get out of the air force because at the time my dad, he, he was so, it hurt him, you know, and he had a lot of healing to do. And he would joke and say, if they deploy you, and they take you as a prisoner of war, they're going to be begging the president to give you back. Like, you know, he was trying to hope they probably would have. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know, and so I, I just knew that I needed to be there for my family. Again, I knew that life was fragile. It was kept coming up. And so I decided to transfer into the United States Public Health Service and I could stay in the, D- the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area because all of the headquarter positions were here. And so I, I could just keep moving and stay so I could be an hour away from my family in Mass. And my sisters were in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. So I was able to, you know, really, um, you know, and, and keep myself here. You know, although I had to have still a lot of deployments and a lot of things that have happened. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that's how that ended up happening. Wow. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Malaysia. It's like with hearing your story, I just get speechless and like <laughs> it's God, it's not me. Yeah. I'm telling you, I don't know how I'm here, to be honest with you. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's and you still have a smile on your face, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what what we what else we gonna do? You know what what else? Yeah, you you're like yes, it hurts. You know, and, and when we start to talk about the rest of the journey, it's been a lot of pain. But if you have the ability to get out of bed and make a decision that you're gonna walk in your purpose, because that's what gives me my ha- that helps me to know that I have value in this world. So when you get that opportunity to make a decision, you might need some help. It's not easy. I'm not, oh yeah, I'll be depressed or not. No, there's real illnesses, just like every other medical condition, which I, you know, did psychotherapy for so long. So I'm not saying that like, oh, it's just easy. Turn the switch off or on. I'm not saying that. Making that choice means you need to figure out what you need to do to make the life the way you want it. Mm-hmm. It might be counseling. It might be medication. It might be going and trying this complementary and alternative medicine 
resource that's available for you. Mm -hmm. Some of them old regimens our families used to use from generations on down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Prayer, mm -hmm. meditation, figure that out. I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying you have a decision to make to live or thrive. You could, we live in now. I'm talking about actually living, serving your purpose. What does that mean? I'm not just waking up every day and doing mindless activities and not having any purpose or feeling like you don't have a purpose. That's not what I mean. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> So, oh my goodness. So, so, so you're in, you're in DC and you're working you're at this point. This is where you're working for the surgeon general. This is cutting out a little bit. I don't know what's going on. Just you said I'm in DC. Oh, I think we just froze. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you're in DC. And so this is when you were working for the, the surgeon general. Yeah. So I, I became active duty and then I, um, I started the, uh, behavioral health program and primary care at Fort Meade. Mm -hmm. And so after that is when I got selected, you mm -hmm. know, to be the special mm -hmm. assistant to the Surgeon General of the United States, the 16th. So that was an amazing blessing, you know, that I got to go to the White House all the time. I got to meet President Obama and per former President Obama in person, wow. you know, going to Nancy Pelosi's you know, um, balls at the Library of Congress or receptions and oh, wow. just seeing people in motion. I, again, I used to go to the White House and I remember saying, one day I'm going to be here. Wow. One day I always said that. Oh my God. I always said that. And my uncle, he was, he was a former Marine. And I, well, then again, for Marines, once a Marine, always a Marine. So simplify, sorry. But he was a Marine. And um, he used to meet me every time. And I remember I was so proud of him for being a Marine. And he had traveled outside of the country and was stationed in other places. And he used to bring me stuff back from like Japan. And I just thought that was so cool that he got to travel. And, you know, I really looked up to him. But I always said, like, I'm going to be I'm going to be in this White House. And I didn't knew I didn't know how yeah. or what. But, yeah. yeah, I was always at the White House. Jeez, there is so much foreshadowing in your life. Like it's it is. It's like a movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's nuts how much foreshadowing there is in your life, you know, between the yeah. social worker, you know, you're finally the first one you're able to confide in outside of, you know, your siblings, the social worker, and then you yeah. meet her as an adult. Yeah. You know, going to near now people and then people got to confide in me. Yeah. And I got to talk to someone who it was their first time you know, divulging uh, the abuse and nobody knew. Mm -hmm. So it, it, a lot of. <laughs> so yeah. much. Yeah. So much foreshadowing. Yeah. It's, it's like, and it's like the more you share and the, and the more pieces that are connected together, it's just like, I know you're going to help so many people. That's my prayer. Like, I know you are. You're gonna help. <laughs> Thank so, like, you. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. No. Like it's 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 not even one of those things of the if. It's not an if. It's just yeah. It's the when. You know. Like yeah. It's gonna happen. You're gonna yeah. help so many people, and yeah. even with you having all your connections and everything, all the work you've done in DC, like you're gonna bring yeah. so much reform as well. <laughs> Like, you know, and I'm so excited that you're here just sharing your journey, sharing your life, sharing everything, because like, I know you're going to do some really powerful things. Thank you. And Thank you're already you. starting, you know, you're already starting it. You're already starting it, you know? Yeah. Well, and then in military work, all those high things, you know, so it's like for me, sometimes I have to acknowledge what I've done and where I've been, because when you go forward again, it gets more challenging. It doesn't get easier, especially for people who want to make a difference. Yeah. And so I have to remember like, no, I've been doing this, but it was in a different capacity. Yeah. Right. This many lives working in these big positions, 
you know, doing big things. And so I encourage people to really always acknowledge everything that you're doing and you've done because sometimes the mountain always seems so high. There's another mountain now. You've, You've come over this one, but now there's another one and it seems so big and it's like, why am I doing this? This is so hard. I have to, we have to reflect and say, no, I, I, I have been of service. I have been value added to people's lives. Because mm-hmm. you all, for me, I have to remind myself. Because on those days when it's gotten so hard over the past couple of years, I have to remember. Remember that movie, Mufasa uh, and Lion King? Yes. I always think about that. Where Rafiki says to um, Simba, remember. Oh no, it wasn't, it wasn't him. It was his father. Mm. So yeah. it was actually Mufasa's image, his spiritual image. When he went to look at the water and he kept saying, remember who you remember. So anytime you get down, watch that part. It's even on, uh, Inst- on YouTube. I've had to go and watch that. Like, remember. <laughs> yeah. But- you know, pivoting a little bit into the spiritual stuff kind of is like that. You got to remember what, why you're here, what it your is. purpose is, you know. It is. It is. And even in, 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 as you said, you know, of course, what we went through is challenging and what you're doing is challenging, but it's a different capacity. At the same time, all the things that you went through that was challenging previously gave you the skills to deal with the current challenges today. Yeah. But but I thought I, I again when the when the next challenge came, the big one that changed my entire life, I was like, oh no, I can't do this. I can't I can't. It's time to go. It's time to go. I was done. And this is your <laughs> near death experience you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's dive into that. So, you know, um, so I'm going on with my career. I had gotten promoted um, to captain Navy rank for the United States. Public. So these were big accomplishments that I was working so hard to do and to, you know, get all the accolades and to continue to be of service. The other thing is not all just about the accolades, because sometimes you need to be in a position to be able to help make change. Yes. So, yeah, if, if you don't aspire to do certain things, then it doesn't matter. Yeah. But for people who aspire to make a real change or impact and be of value and be of service, mm-hmm. you have to do certain things to be able to even sit with the people who might be making the decisions or you might be contributing to making the decisions as well. Yeah. So, again, I had gotten I had gotten married You know, and that was the whole thing, because for me, I was already making plans. I was going to, you know, at that time, live in a Trump Tower, you know, back in the day. That was the stat. You know, I said, I'm going to retire and I'm just going to I'm going to have people to be able to help me out and do what I need. And I'm going to retire, you know, when I got older and stuff. That was my plan. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know I wanted love, but I didn't know if I'd have it because I had been you know, I was this long-term serial monogamous. I always, I had someone, but um, after going in the military, that that was really done. There was no, you couldn't date everywhere you went. You couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, being a a African-American female officer, girl. And then being in positions to make recommendations for people's career. So like the commanders of the, the large command for the whole base is calling you personally. You can't date anybody. You need a background check, please. Uh, yes, yes, ma'am. You know, and so, um, so I, I was, I got married, you know, and my husband, he's retired army. So, you know, that was a blessing to have somebody to be able to understand, you know, what I was going through and, mm-hmm. you know, having somebody who could help me with certain things, mm-hmm. you know, with my uniform and just navigating because he had, you know, been in over 20 years. So he also knew. Um, but then so we're just rolling along and then 9-11 happens. I mean, not 9-11, um, the pandemic. Mm-hmm. 
And so the pandemic happens and um, I ended up getting deployed. Now I have been deployed to many deployments and, you know, some of them were traumatic and, you know, going to places where just having all this loss. And um, so I got sent to the Navajo Nation in um, Arizona and they sent me to the most desolate area and it was called Cayenta. Now they sent me out with a team, but they sent us all to separate places. Um, so I got sent to a place where I was the only mental health provider and they sent me by myself. And I remember talking to a provider after that, like a counselor, and she's like, no, they didn't. They don't do that. So when I got there, I was all, I was intimidated because so I wore my uniform and everything. And when I got there it was hot. And I mean, again, there was the death toll was high at on this particular portion of the reservation. Like I was actually staying on the reservation where they sent the other team members. So it was like maybe five or six people where they sent them. They had hotels, they had resources, they had means, but they had sent me by myself to a place where there was no Walmart, no nothing. So it, it was like a three hour situation for me to go to Walmart, come back. And there was no reception on the phone. So my husband's trying to, you know, stay on the phone with me and make sure I'm okay. Cause they had these ridges. And so literally your car can go over, you know, they had this little tiny, you know, rail or whatever. But if you have fallen asleep and you go like, you're going to be in the, you're going to be in the mountains in the ditches. Wow. Like, I don't even know if they could get a helicopter to get to you at some of them places. And so, um, again, I'm, I'm tough, right? I'm strong. I've done it. I seen so much. Y'all ain't, y'all ain't telling me nothing. You know, I've done, I was in karate as a teenager. I'm fine. I got this. As soon as I got there, this gentleman, so I'm going to go into the hotel. This gentleman walks up to me. Now, I had been stationed in North Dakota. So, you know, there was a lot of methamphetamines and cases and stuff up there. So I had, you know, and I became an addictions medicine specialist, you know, by this time. So I got my certification. I was the director of addictions medicine at one point for the whole defense health agency, work with the White House and the ONDCP, Office of National Drug. I did all the things. Right. And so I recognized I was like, no, I think he's on mess. So he just kept coming to me. You know, normally, again, where I'm from, you don't just walk up on people like that. So I'm I'm yeah, I'm. I'm and I'm frozen because I'm like, I'm in uniform. I'm active duty. I can't come to the Navajo Nation and, and, and injure someone, you know. Mm. And at the same time, I worked on death row. I worked with the prison, all these things and family advocacy. Some of these people, when they take these drugs, like they're they're not they're not they're beyond their human phase at their point they have a level of strength so i'm i'm terrified mm. i'm terrified if this because he just kept coming you know and i'm like hey you know how you doing like trying to look you in your eye like okay you know uh, but i'm scared mm -hmm. i'm scared mm -hmm. i don't know if this man gonna hurt me so anyway he he was trying to but he and he really wasn't saying anything mm-hmm it was very, it was very odd and it was very scary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. it was like a zombie situation almost. Mm. And in the place, it had a dark energy about it, mm. just real dark. Mm -hmm. And so this lady ended up coming out from the door and was like telling him to go away. But mm -hmm. at that point, the energy had been set for me. Like I need to be on, like for real, like you not coming up, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I, I did a lot of prayer and I had to work out in my room because I couldn't be outside. So those that man was there. But there was also what's called these res dogs. They let their dogs run wild, like mm -hmm. on a the reservation. Mm -hmm. They don't really stay at their house. And so I had to like sneak out of the hotel. And it's I'm not saying ho it's like a little one of them little baits kind of motel. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like a tiny thing. It wasn't. And I couldn't you know, you couldn't use the water there. So anyway, I would sneak to my car and try to figure out which door I could park to get in. So to run for, cause they had pit bulls. 
Oh my and God. I had even heard stories of people getting harmed by these dogs. And a couple of years later, after I left, I saw it wasn't necessarily there, but where a 13 year old had been killed by one of them. Oh, wow. So I was in fear for my life from the minute I got there. But again, I'm strong. Again, I'm not saying nothing. I'm not, I'm tough. I got this. Nobody, mm-hmm. you know, the angel's been here all this time. I'm praying, I'm meditating. So I decided you know, to, to take baths every day. And I remember I went to Walmart and I got all this bath stuff. And again, remember they were on lockdown for um, seven days a week. So you even couldn't be out at a certain time. And for me to even, and then all the stores closed. So mm-hmm. there was just one little tiny grow. It wasn't, it was like a mart. It wasn't a grocery store. They had McDonald's, they had church's chicken. So it was like a food desert for real. And so I had to get food, try to run from because I was the men, the sole mental health provider and the lead for the incident response team for all mental health for two medical centers. Mm-hmm. And so I would rotate between the centers. I would see all of you know the staff members. So I was there to help the staff members and the stories that I was told, um, even from their historical perspective, my mind, my emotions, everything was going in this dark space. It was like, what is, it was like the world was not real. And I thought I was serving. And I thought at that time, like, I'm not doing nothing. If if we have people who are living like this, no running water in their homes, their generations were taken out because of COVID because they live tribally. Am I really served? Like, what am I doing? That's what I felt. And so by the time I left, again, I was exercising, I was working out. Um, I was, you know, I felt myself getting very anxious and agitated and a lot of things happened. And um, when I left, I came, ended up coming home and me and my husband were going on a walk. And, you know, I thought I had did my, I had a Peloton bike. So I kept, I thought I had overdid it. I was doing it several times a day. I was trying to get my mind right. Again, I've been through things. So all I got to do is exercise, right? That's what I'm thinking. I had did bodybuilding, um, like as far as lifting weights all the time, going to the shows, I did races all over the world, you know, did the Marine Corps marathon. Like I was good. Like I knew. So I started having pain. And um, again, I just thought I could treat it myself, take some Advil, put it up, put some heat, some cold, all that stuff. And one night I woke up and Jessica, I couldn't walk. I needed to go to the bathroom. I crawled to the bathroom. I was in pain. I could not walk. And I was on the floor and um, I was crying. I couldn't get up, but I didn't want to wake my husband up. So I said, well, so he ended up hearing me cry. He came in there and I was like, I got to go to the bathroom. I was like, I can't walk. And he's like, what's wrong? What's going on? And I was like, I don't know. I'm in pain. So anyway, he helped me, you know, I went to the bathroom. He helped me go back to bed. And then I ended up, um, we ended up calling an ambulance one day and they brought me to this medical, this small little medical center in my community. And they gave me morphine, took an x-ray, sent me home. They said nothing was wrong. And so, um, yeah, follow up with your provider. At that point, they, it ain't nothing ain't broke. They gave you morphine and then sent you home? Right. The fact they gave you morphine should indicate there's something wrong. They, I should have probably been sent to an ER or something to be yeah. hospitalized. Yeah. If they gave you morphine. Like, that's serious painkillers. I mean, you know, sometimes people think that, oh, you know, people are drug seeking or whatever. So, again, you already know that whole you you mm-hmm. may or may not. But the pain thing when it comes yeah. to people of color and all the biases and the disparities in the healthcare yeah. center. You you got it. They got all the research. I'm doing all the research on it, actually. Mm-hmm. But um, so anyway, it was time again. And I just at this point, I really knew so, so when I look at the situation now, like my death was imminent. And when that was happening, I didn't get to everything because I'm going to tell you. So I had my grandmother came to me in a dream. Uh, so before that day that I was telling you, I walked with my husband, I was having pain, but I didn't really. She came to my dream and she basically gave me the message that it was time for me to go with her. 
And so I was like, cool. Like I did a lot, you know, but it was in my dream. And I'm so after the dream, I had this sense of calm on me. You know, and at this time, I thought I had it all, but I, everything was breaking down. Right. My mental, my spiritual, my physical things were starting to break down. So I'm like, I got, you know, OK, I was at peace. It's time to go. Let's go. You know, because, I, again, I was always seen in this great light with every, with, you know, in my career. And, and so I couldn't be seen as anything else. But then at that point, your life's over. Well, it's time. It's time. So um, my husband's like, no, we're going to the military hospital this time. And I'm like, but I can't get down the stairs. We need the ambulance. He was like, you want to get on my back. When I tell you I screamed at the top of my lungs, I thought somebody was going to call. And the way I was screaming was like murder. And nobody did call the police. I thought somebody would hear it and call the police. And so he finally, he gets me to um, Andrews Air Force Base and I'm telling them my symptoms and they rush me. They send me to Walter Reed. And at that point, like people didn't really under, they didn't, they took the blood levels. They wasn't understanding what was going on. They, they didn't see nothing, but I knew I was dying and I was singing hymnals in my head. I was coming to peace with myself. I was thinking about all the things that I didn't get to do in life. I was like, oh, I didn't get to swim. I didn't learn how to swim and all the thing. I didn't get to go to Egypt. It was all these things that was running through my mind of people and places. And, you know, I started contacting people because I knew it was almost time to go. Just not telling them that, not letting anyone know. But I just I, there were people that I wanted to talk to or let them know that I love them. Because I didn't think I was going to make it because the doctors were saying nothing was wrong. And I knew I was leaving. My, I was dying. And um, so four days in, the doctor comes in. And again, I'm a guinea pig because this is a training hospital for the military. And so they have people from all, all they had cl classrooms of people studying me, you know, and trying to understand. And so the fourth day, I remember that doctor came in and he said to me, he said, uh, Captain Harrell, we can't find anything. So we're going to send you home today. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And as I think about that now, what I felt at that time was your life is not valuable. You've helped so many people. You've helped to contribute to saving the lives of dozens of people who were homicidal and suicidal. All these things you did to help everybody. And when I come back home from deployment, you're telling me you can't find anything and you're sending me home. So they said, well, we're gonna send in a psychiatrist because you just got back from deployment. So I'm a mental health provider. I had to put on my whole mask of being a provider at this point and speaking their language and looking at them in their eyeballs. And I said, you can euthanize me because you wouldn't be able to deal with this pain. So they had me on dilated every whatever hours on, you know, I mean, the pain was unbearable. It was death pain. And so if I'm at that level of pain and you say you're sending me home. So I say, you can euthanize me, get the paperwork. All right. And, and again, I didn't, I wasn't thinking at the time, but my Nana already told me I was coming home with her. So let's go just end it now. So I ain't got to, what, what I'm talking to you for. You don't care about my life. So after I said that and I, I started being very professional, I said, I'm a mental health provider. If this is a somatic symptom, send in that psychiatrist because we need to figure out what's going on. We need to figure it out. And so they sent in the psychiatrist and he's talking to me. And again, I'm still on. I'm on. I'm in my provider mode. Nothing wrong. I'm telling you what's, you know, ain't my mental health. But I'm sure my mental health was completely off. Is <laughs> You know what I mean? Ain't no way anybody going through that. 
Like you sending me home I'm about to die. So me, meantime, I'm not being treated for anything, just the pain. So they end up doing this fluoroscopy. They took this long needle, they put it in my hip and they take it out. And they, within maybe 20 minutes or so, I don't know the time frame. My husband, he was coming and visit me every day. Like he was there and they come in there and I'm telling you, everybody's running in the room. She got a septic hip. Try to send me home with a septic hip. So, so I was like, I knew I had to act like I was professional and, and couldn't act crazy or nothing and really express my emotions because if they, even if they put me in the mental health portion, I would have died. Cause they what they you gotta treat that right away. I've heard of many cases of people who have septus and they die that day within hours. And you had it for how long? A week? So I'm I'm yeah, probably yeah. Well, it was it was bad when I was in the hospital. So it was bad, 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 bad. Like it was bad already, but I was I could have tolerated a, a lot of pain because I had been I again, I had been through so much. It took a lot. You know what's crazy? So by that time, it was like, okay, I'm I'm singing the songs to go to heaven now. But and I'm praying crazy. and I'm praying for my soul and all of that, trying to tell the people I love them. It's crazy though, because you you knew. I knew. I I was I can't even explain this, but I was spiritually already starting that's what i'm saying that makes sense yeah no 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 it makes sense it makes sense it makes sense and the reason why i i understand it makes sense is because my my childhood best friend she passed away she had cancer mm -hmm. and literally the week of her passing she packed up her house you know she was making arrangements but on social media she was saying Oh, I have a doctor's appointment, guys. Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray. Yep. But she was yep. making her preparations because she she knew she was going to be passing soon. Yeah. It's so crazy. So at the time, my girlfriend, um, I'll never forget because she's no longer with us. Um, she was in Afghanistan and I wanted to I want to let her know, like, I love her and stuff. And so I was sending her messages on WhatsApp. And so she was like, she, at the time that was about August. So she was coming home around January, February from Afghanistan. They had extended her tour out there. And what happened was after she got home shortly after she got diagnosed with breast cancer and she ended up passing away November, 2022. Wow. So between all of that, and I had a lot of survivor's guilt. Again, you didn't care about me anyway. And then I had to fight for care. I had to fight because it was during COVID. It was a lot of challenges. People couldn't get appointments and a lot of the specialty care was shut down. But even, you know, navigating the bureaucracy of getting, if, if you have all these ailments and you need all of these referrals to specialty care, you have to see your primary care manager every single time. So that's putting it out 60 days already because it's already going to take you 30 days to get in with your provider. Wow. And by the time you get the referral, it's probably 30 days to get into them or 60. Wow. Whatever is the access to care standard. So it was like, I, I, w I didn't want it. I didn't want it. So it was like, why did you take her when I didn't even want to be here? Because people, because everyone indirectly was saying your life is not important. Mm -hmm. So when we look at suicide rates of veterans and me being a provider and being able to be having to be on the other side of the couch. I, I can tell you why now. I can empathize a lot more now. Yeah. No one understands you. Your family doesn't understand you. It's tough. <laughs> but I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> Jeez. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 
Wow. Mm-hmm. You literally have me speechless. Like, I'm here. Yes. And so what happened was then, you know, my body, I had three surgeries back to back. I had to get a hip replacement. Um, then I, so the, the spring of the next year, my hair started falling out first in February and I was having a lot of pain, body pain, but I just thought my body was stressed. Well, that, you know, again, when you go to the doctor, they say it's just stress. You had a lot going on. And so then one day I was thought I was having a stroke. I was having all these symptoms, chest pain. I was, ha- it felt like um, thunder was shoot, lightning was shooting on my head. I was having this stinging pain. And um, I went to the hospital and they did an x-ray because, again, this is during COVID. So we don't know. Everybody had to be tested. Right. So I did this chest x-ray. I didn't have COVID, but I had all these lesions all over my lungs. Yeah. And so. Lesions <laughs> on your lung? I had lesions on my lungs. So they ended up hospitalizing me again. Stroke? Like, how did you have lesions on your lung? So they, they thought it was cancer. So they had, they kept me in a hospital for about a week. Um, I got out that Thursday. My sister had came down. My sister and her family kept coming up and down, helped take care of me every time I was in the hospital and they did the x-ray. They couldn't tell what it was though at the time. And so that Sunday, I remember my sister and them, they were going and her family, they were going back home and I, look at the pictures now. And I saw that my face was starting to droop on one side. And so as soon as she left that evening, I had full blown Bell's palsy. My face dropped down. And so at this point, I thought I had a terminal illness and they weren't telling me because you know how that is like when you first, yeah. you know, they're not going to want to tell you in the ER or, or them if they don't really know for sure. Yeah. If. And so I thought I had a terminal illness. So we went back to the hospital and I said, listen, if I if I need palliative care, you need to tell me, you know, I'm like, and my husband's like, I heard you in the in the waiting room, like you was going on. <laughs> and so it took about six months again, going from specialist to specialist, test to test. I had so much imaging on my body, and um, they diagnosed me with sarcoidosis. And I couldn't understand because I said I had never heard of it. Yeah. And my family, it wasn't a trait or anybody that I knew in my family had. And so I, yeah. so I remember the day they finally diagnosed me, it was this nurse and they were like, oh, you know, we have this nurse manager and she's the coordinator for people with sarcoidosis. And we have this meeting, this, this uh, support group. Again, I'm just like, what is it like? Because it really acts just like cancer. It's a twilight disease. And um, so it affects your organs. So whatever one it attaches to, a lot of people have to get replacements, like lung replacements, whatever it attaches to. So what what is it? What is it? I've never heard of it ever. What What is it? So, yeah, it's a it's a disease where, um, you know, these lesions, they come and they attack your immune system. And it's really, I think, due to a lot of inflammation is, you know, what I'm reading about it. And um, um, so it, it attacks your organs. And so sometimes they have to replace it because you will no longer have that lo- that level of functioning that you need for that organ. Um, so people get them. Eye, you have eye issues that some people get on their skin. And so I'll never forget, they sent me to this nurse manager and, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, it's a lady of color too. Like I I could really talk and say what I feel. And so I tried to confide and I was like, I don't know what this means. I was scared. You know, should I be planning to, you know, how long will I live? And so I was like, I never heard of it. And she said, the first thing she said to me, yes, you did. Bernie Mac died of it. That's the first thing she said to me. Oh my God. I kid you not. I'm I'm not even, I don't even know how I'm, again, I say to you, I don't know how I'm still here. This isn't the half of it, but I had to give you some of the highlights. Wow. Crazy. Yeah. 
This is why people take their lives. This is why. <laughs> the empathy, the compact, where is it? You tell people to ask for help. And when they ask for help, you put them through hell to get it. And you make them feel like they're just a number and they're a bother to you. Not everybody, not everyone, because I'm here. My doctor, uh, Dr. Cody at Walter Reed Medical Center, he saved my life. So I will tell people who are going through similar situations you know, to call on someone who can really support you. And I don't necessarily mean like, oh, your spouse, your sister, your brother, your mother, because they're not going to understand on a professional level how to interact with you. Because if you've been this person so strong, again, they're not going to understand that. They're not going to even wrap their head around you being close to death. They're not going to understand. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I'm so blessed to be here. I'm going to tell you, Jessica, I'm so blessed. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So how, so what, how did you, I, you know, you're still here today, right? So today. <laughs> so yes. what was that healing process like? Like what, how did you, yeah, how did you recover? Well, and I won't say like, oh, I've arrived. I've taken the <laughs> the red pill and I'm all, you know, whatever it is. Um, what I'll say is this, is that, you know, I decided to really hang up the psychotherapy and the counseling mm. to really do spiritual uh, coaching because I feel like a lot of things that happen to us are something on a spiritual level. And so in order to heal the external, you need to heal the internal and also mm -hmm. your spiritual level. And so it's been a it's been a deep journey. And I'm still like, again, I haven't arrived, but I really you know, I started my Ph.D. for mind body medicine. Again, I want to learn. I want to understand. I want to, you know, understand how to heal yourself because they have me on 20 something medications a day, oral chemo, prednisone. I was up to 254 pounds. I didn't, again, why am I living? I don't need to be here. My nan already told me it's time to go. Why am I here? But she was warning me. She was warning me now that I know. She was warning me that there's something dire or wrong with you. And so sometimes I think we get messages and we get them in a way that identifies with who you would trust to tell you that information. Yeah. So I believe God's messages comes through, you know, the people who we love most, who we would trust and accept that information from. Yeah. So, so that, that's what happened. Hmm. So, so up until that point, like you didn't even deal with your trauma really like head on before. No, no. What? It's in the closet. That's in the past. What do you mean? I'm not yeah. talking about this. So literally you're knocking at death's door when you started looking inside and saying, I need to heal. Yeah. Inside. And yeah, just all the people I wish I would have apologized to, or that I would have made amends with and, all of those things, those questions that came up. And I realized, so after that, I even realized that there still could have been a possibility with me passing away because I was, I had a, um, uh, um, what is it? The thing, the sleep mask, the sleep apnea. Oh yeah. And I was 250, but I was gasping for air at night, even with the mask on my husband said, you're gasping for air. And so I just knew that it was, it was still, I was still thinking that I was going to not be here. Yeah. And I also had told God, I can't live like this. I could not live in that pain and that anguish and the mental pain and the, and the trauma. I couldn't live like that. Yeah. I wanted life, the good parts of life to remember. And I didn't want to be this disabled person, Yeah. you know, or somebody with the inability to do what I did. Yeah. And so I just knew I was like, I can't live like this. And so I just really went on my own spiritual transformational journey within myself, 
Mm-hmm. And I had to look internally and really do some deep digging. And then all of the trauma started to come out, all mm-hmm. of them. You know, as you're facing this, then this is coming up. This is coming up. Mm-hmm. These things are coming up. And you're alone. Yeah. Because no one understands. They didn't hear some of this stuff. No. And again, they're going through so much of their own trauma because you're the person that they usually call that you can't even get a word in about yours. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. So, again, I don't really matter. It's about everybody else and not me. Yeah, I did everything for everybody else. And I, I just needed a little thing for me. <sighs> but what I ultimately realized is that when God is trying to get your attention, when there is something, some sort of mission for you to do. It would have had to happen that way. Otherwise, I would have never, not that it wouldn't have ever happened, but I was going to do 30 years. Potentially, I was thinking about, you know, could I make Admiral? I was excited. I loved everything that I did. It wasn't easy. It was hard, but it was like I felt like I was valuable, that I had an impact in this world. So I went on that quest. I went to a retreat in Sedona, Arizona. Um, That's the Sedona Soul Adventures. And if anybody looks it up and you call them, make sure you get Rick. He was my spirit guide. And I told him things that I had never told anyone because they got to do an assessment to make a plan just for you. And you go see the practitioners and the providers. But I was really looking for things that were complementary and alternative. I knew I was I was going to die taking the meds. I'm surprised I didn't get diabetes the amount of president. Every, everything kept saying you get, I, I was research. I was trying to read and understand. So they're not there to heal you. They're there to treat the symptom. Yeah. You know, they're there to treat the symptom. And so, yeah, I went there. I ended up, um, you know, I ended up getting a coach and my coach is wonderful. And then he referred me to the Reality Center in Santa Monica, California. And I went there and I got this wellness, this multi-sensory wellness experience that mimics like kind of the psychedelic experience, but mm-hmm. only but with only technology, with vibration, with sound, with mm-hmm. music, with lighting. Um, because, again, when your body can't heal when it's not in you know, homeostasis, right? So your body can't heal at all. So I was learning and I, through school and just trying to learn all these things to understand, you know, what I needed to do. And I did it. It's up to you to heal you. It's up to God to heal you, but God gives you the tools. You not sit there and like, oh, I'm just going to pray and I'm not going to do nothing else and I'm going to be healed. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. You know, once you do ask for guidance and you're willing to take action on that, you're going to get these these little sprinkles of miracles. You're going to meet people. They're going to tell you, connect with this person, you know, and now I'm doing a retreat in Santa Monica in Mm -hmm. October, you know, to bring people to experience this. I want people to know that there's resources available. You don't have to take your life. You can live heaven on earth. But you have to find your way. You have to find your way there. And once you get alignment with in alignment with what your divine assignment is, whatever that is that comes naturally to you, what you should be doing, what your story of life that has led you up to this. Once you take hold of that and you accept it and you surrender. And surrender is not easy. Like, oh, I'm surrendered. I'm no, that's a, that's a daily. That's like doing weights, doing reps every day. It sucks, but you better employ them spiritual muscles. Yes. And get in alignment. Yes. Cause the the world is telling you, no, you supposed to be drinking this, eating this, the standard American diet. You Mm -hmm. supposed to be watching all this horror on TV. You supposed Mm -hmm. to be all the cop shows. All we had was chips when I was coming up. Mm-hmm. Chips. And there was another one. I don't remember. But yeah, watching at my grandmother's house, because no, my great grandmother, because nobody else had cable. You know, mm-hmm. I just I remember 
you know, now all you see is trauma. You turn on the news and all there's trauma. So you think the world is bad. You yeah. start to get in this low vibrational state. Yeah. You don't see all the great work, you and people who are trying to show people that you have the ability to work with God and have these resources and make a change mm -hmm. for yourself and other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really? You can do that? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And not work for somebody else and just do their mission, which you're, you're going to work and you're you're doing what you need to do. And you feel like this is success because I have money. This is success because I have all the things. This is success because I have the titles. But then your health breaks down. You're feeling burnt out. Everything breaks down. You're, you're getting sick. You know, you don't know why you feel. Even though I think mm -hmm. probably eventually something would have happened with all the stress that was happening. But I know that, you know, at that deployment, I believe it was the water that got, you know, I had I was taking baths every single day. So it's not normal that you would be in that water that was not healthy for that long of a period of time. Yeah. And I remember cutting my leg on that side. So I believe oh, it got into my, yeah, you had again, a, a lot of reflection, but again, I, I'm not, I, I'm not even in that field scientifically to give you a scientific reason. Yeah. I believe this was a whole spiritual situation that got me and, and is bringing me, you know, as I, again, I haven't arrived. We're still here yeah, and I still have work to do, Yeah, but it's getting me there. Yeah. 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 So I had to heal. I couldn't work out, you know, in pain all the time, still have remnant. I still have it, the headache, all that. Wow. But I do things that work for me now. So I had to figure out how to lose this weight. Because with all that weight, that was that alone was going to make my health go down, especially with all the disease and all the diseases and all the things I had, mm -hmm. all the medications. Mm hmm. You better figure it out. The answers are already inside of you. What you need to do with your life. And I think we try so hard because it seems so scary when you're given the vision that mm -hmm. you're like, I can't do that. That's scary. I don't want people to know my name. I don't want to be out there. I don't want to be exposed. Yeah. I don't want people to know I was sick. I don't, I don't want people to know I was on a walker <laughs> and, you know, got to use a cane yeah. sometime and do all. I don't want people to know that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. So in your in your healing journey, it's like it basically unfolded this new path that you're on today. It did. A whole different. I'm on a whole different set of guidance, I guess, spiritual guidance to tell me what to do. And it's so weird, Jessica, because even with working with people, it's like because I'm being obedient, if something's not for me, I find out like this now. Yes. Whereas before it took a long, like it you it knew that person time. been in your life for 10 years and you knew. Yeah. But now it's happening. So yeah. I think after COVID, a lot of people started to have time and they start to reflect mm -hmm. and we had a lot of loss. And so people are like, now I'm going to go through a life that no, Mm -hmm. But spiritually, things happen. Things are happening now. Me meeting you. Yeah. Like things just, they start happening. The people who need to be there are going to be there. The resources you need, you don't see it. And you're like, God, I'm scared. I don't know. And it's too stressful. And I don't want to get any headaches. And I don't want to be in pain. But again, when you're in alignment, things occur. Your experience is so much different that it doesn't feel like I'm doing this thing. It feels like I'm doing what I was put on this earth to do. Yeah. It's different. And then things just happen so easy. Easy and challenging at the same time, but uh, the yes. flow is different. Yes. Yes. Because again, yes. you're going to meet people that it's not supposed to be there. You're still going to keep meeting. So you're going to still be tested. Yeah. With different situations, mm -hmm. you're like, I have this heart for humanity and you come out in the business world and it's like, this is the dog eat dog. This ain't, a balance. <laughs> this ain't yeah. easy. There's a balance between the love and then using discernment and, and Correct. 
acting appropriately for the happens yeah more quickly Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. way more quickly i start to pray on it i meditate on it yeah even forget it took down to the name for my retreat for the events that i just had like i meditate and i okay new day new day elevation retreat you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. it's like it comes Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. it it flows a lot is more easily yeah but the challenge is still there the work is still there Yes. Because in order for you to impact a lot of people, you got to be able to be able to handle what's coming, mm-hmm. you know, and, and all the people you're going to interact with and all the rest of the experiences, good and not so that things that may seem negative. But yeah. again, I'm looking at them differently because I'm like, that had to happen. Mm-hmm. Had I brought you with me when I was at this place, you might have harmed me real bad or or my family or my brand or or my whatever people think that I'm here and my passion and you mm-hmm. you know what I mean I needed to know that thank you mm-hmm. so you're like thank you I needed to thank you it might hurt still but thank you it's I needed different. that I needed it's, to know yeah. now yeah you have a different mm-hmm. perspective you have a different perspective you have a different way different perspective mm-hmm. so Malaysia if you could give your top, let's say, three to five pieces of advice for people who are struggling and going through very traumatic experiences, but they know they have that piece of greatness in them, what would you tell them today for that greatness Ooh, to be unleashed? The top three things, huh? Mm-hmm. So w- number one is consult with God that's inside of you for all the decisions that you're going to make and everything that you're going to do as far as your purpose and being in alignment. And what I mean by that is when we're in a dark place, we don't see the light and we feel like we're so disconnected from God. And that's why we feel like, why am I here? I, I don't, but it's like we're made in the image and likeness of God. So God is in you. Because you're going to see God through me, right? Through my kindness, through my love that I give you. And so that's what allows you to know that God exists. So I would say to consult with God and and, in yourself, because everything that has been instilled in you and all the resources are inside of you. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say to go inward you know, and consult with God about what your path is and what were you supposed to get from every experience that you went through? Why did you go through that? And I didn't even realize until again, we're going through them like, oh, that's still, I'm still learning as I even talk about it. That's why this is so he- healing and freeing. It's like, I don't care what you think. I don't care about none of that. I got to do because time is not your time is not promised. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like in, in try. So now when I'm making decisions for number two, have your own personal mission and vision. Because when you have a business, Everything that you're going to do in that business is going to align with what that vision and vision is. And that should be based on your divine assignment and your divine calling. So, mm-hmm. any, so there's going to be things that come and we're all, we want to do all the things. Are any of those things in alignment with my mission, my, my mission and my vision? Cause again, you can have a lot of goals, but are they in alignment with those? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. from the people you interact with, from the conversations that you have. So when we find ourselves talking negative and, you know, getting gossip up, oh, turn it off. Or after the conversation, I forgive myself. Yeah. I forgive myself for having that conversation. Clear, clear yourself, clear your energy, clear that air from that negative and toxic energy. Mm-hmm. Cause you're no long, you're not where you are, are going to arise to spiritually, but you're not that person that was where you've come from either. Yes. Right. You're on this journey journey. Mm-hmm. So anytime you try to go back, okay. Okay. I'm going to acknowledge it and I'm going to forgive myself. And now I'm going to move on. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
And this may be the hashtag of the keep God first in your life and all the things that you do consult. It may seem like I'm supposed to be doing this. And even now it's like, maybe this is my path, but maybe I'm not doing it the right way mm. or the way that it, I need to do it. Mm-hmm. So I'm, so I'm fighting a little bit and I'm thinking I'm knowing, or I'm meeting a person that's not supposed to be in my life. God will reveal it to you. Yeah. Again, you might work with them for six months or whatever. And then you might be like, no, it's not, the energy's not there. It's not really aligning with what I, and just remember that not everybody's going to be there for the rest of your life. Some people may, people, people may be there for a season. Yeah. So I would say, just keep God first in your life and just really consult even from down to, you know, what you're going to wear today, who you're going to interact with. Is this the right time to have the conversation? You know? Yeah. And then the other thing, this isn't one of the top three. I did the three, but when I, when it comes to doing things in my life and making decisions on what I want to be doing or where I need to get to, to get to what my assignment is, if this was your last day, would would you be doing this? Would you be at that job? So not saying that you don't have to work, but you're so miserable. This is your last day. Would you be there? Mm-hmm. Would you be in that environment? Mm-hmm. 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 So number four is so again. We, you don't have to make ma- radical, but you will see that as you change and you do the inner work, your the world around you will change too. Yeah, your outlook, the way you look about yourself, the way you talk about other people, the way you serve will yeah. be different. Yeah, I thought serving meant working myself to death and putting in eighty hours a week. That's not serving. You don't have the energy to even be creative enough to even hear. Be creative or hear what the messages of what you're supposed to do. So mm-hmm. you just you just be doing busy work at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. 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 And basically, so your 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 uh, top advice number four is living every single day like it's your last, but purposeful. A purposeful life. Purpose, purposeful, because you might have to go to a conference that you really don't want. So I'm, I don't mean, but I mean, are you in a, so if any environment that you're in, is it going to promote peace and love for you? Yeah. So even if you get there and it's, it look crazy. That I'm ain't out. it. That ain't I'm it. Out. Mm-hmm. I'll get there. I'll pay for parking and I'll stay for a minute. I'll tell the person who was supposed to, and then I'll get out of there. Yeah. Yeah. You'll know, again, the spiritual realm, it talks very differently. And that is really the realm that is the most loud when you're when you're obedient. And when you when you listen and you have vision, Mm -hmm. you can see things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's like the decisions that you make. And and sometimes you may not make a before where you made a hasty decision. It might take you a moment and say, let me think about this a minute. Yeah. Let me pray on it. Let me meditate on it a minute and then I'll get back with you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You dropped so many gems. You dropped so many <laughs> gems. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Thank where you can for having people me. find you? Where, where can people find you? So I'm on, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm just starting to get more posting on there. Um, but I'm on Instagram um, at Malaysia H. Harrell. You can also follow Blissful Life Consulting, where we offer uh, wellness, holistic wellness solutions for individuals, groups and corporate wellness. And so that's at Blissful Life Consulting on Instagram. And then personally, I I do have a TikTok. You know, we'll start working those. But the websites are www.malaysiaharrell.com and also uh, www.blissfullifeconsulting.com. And so if you need to reach me for partnerships or uh, speaking engagements or coming and do, doing a retreat or wellness workshop, uh, you can, you know, find me there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I also do have a women's community called Dream Life Manifested. 
So here's the logo for it. We had an event yesterday that was so exciting where we talked about the power of aromatherapy. It was also a networking event. But um, that is a really special. I just wanted to mention that because uh, our late, great Robbie Cornelius, he was such an amazing friend and mentor on the, you know, mindset and, and online uh, CEO type business uh, realm. But um, we actually sat down together when I was looking to put my group together. And so I just really wanted to acknowledge him and may he rest in peace because um, the gems that he dropped on your show before his passing was absolutely amazing. And I feel like his inner, his, his, you know, trans, his transition has a lot loud, a lot of people who are in this space of helping others to elevate to a higher level of being and authenticity to really connect. So I just, I really honor his legacy in that way. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Malaysia. And it's so ironic. He's the reason why we met. Yes. I wanted to acknowledge that because a lot of people have been stitching him on um, tick, I don't know if that's the right term, but, you know, doing the, the side by side and, you know, just saying how he impacted their lives. And so he really wanted us to really get out there and um, just really being able to, you know, do what we do and impact the lives of others in a, in a great way. And so um, I'm, I'm honored to have known him. So now that, you know, now that we're all making these connections with each other, with doing great work in the world and inspiring each other. It's just really amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It really yeah. is. Thank you so much, Malaysia. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Jessica. So, yeah, this was, it had me speechless. It had me speechless. And I really appreciate you being on the show and just being so vulnerable with me and, and sharing your, your journey you. with me. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And thank you for what you're doing. It's not easy to hold space sometimes in an environment where, you know, just the world is just doing so many other different things. I think you're so, what you're doing is amazing. I'm just so honored to know you and I love what you're doing and the positivity that you're putting out in the world. It's not just an interview. Again, I didn't realize that I was going to be talking about my entire life. <laughs> But um, I think it's needed because I got so many gems to say, wow, I'm still connecting. I mean, you know, it's mm -hmm. going to take us a lifetime to connect the dots. But it was just very insightful to have this conversation with you. And so thank you for, you know, your platform and what you're doing to inspire us in the world as well. Thank you. Thank you so you're much. Welcome. Thank you.